Um, uh, I listened to the Governor General give the Prime Minister's speech, and there are many things I could comment on in the speech. But the thing I was struck by most was the lip service given to what's been described as the great moral challenge of this generation. That, of course, is the challenge of climate change. How is it that, despite the evidence of catastrophic global warming growing stronger day by day, despite the pleas of the scientific community around the world begging for action on climate change, how is it that we have a government that's now on track to repeal some of the most ambitious and important climate change legislation anywhere in the world? What's going on here? How is it the seemingly rational people can behave so irrationally? I started thinking a bit about this and I started thinking about denial and the mechanism uh, known as denial. And as a medical practitioner, I was really struck by how often people uh, use denial as a way of coping with very uncomfortable truths. It's like the drinker who's on his way to liver failure but denies they've got a drinking problem. It's like the pokies addict who's lost their home and their relationships but denies that they've got a problem on the punt. Um, there's one case that stands out to me. There was a young woman, or a middle-aged woman, who I treated uh, for palliative care uh, because she had end-stage breast cancer. She was a lady who developed a lump. The lump grew and grew. It ulcerated. It became infected. It started to smell. She still didn't see a doctor. It was only when the smell got so bad that her husband said, you've got to go and check this thing out. She'd hidden it from her husband, from her partner, from her family. How is it with that somebody in a situation like that can wait until their husband can no longer tolerate the smell from a fungating breast cancer that they finally see a doctor? Well, it's because of denial. It's a very, very powerful defence mechanism. It's a primitive defence mechanism. It's one of those things that's characteristic of adolescent development. And it's functional. It helps us to avoid confronting an uncomfortable truth, a crushing reality. Um, it's very, very functional. Uh, it exists with good reason. And so what we've got here is a government that refuses to accept the science of climate change because at the very heart of this government is denial. It's why we've got a government that gets itself into contortions over its direct action policy. You know, on one hand, you've got Tony Abbott who calls carbon dioxide a colourless, odourless gas. On the other hand, he comes up with a policy that stinks, a policy that's friendless, not an economist worth their salt, willing to back it up. You see, we've got a lot of members, not all of them, but many members in this government that are climate change deniers, a few of them in the opposition. And so you've got to ask yourself why. What is it about climate change that represents such an uncomfortable reality to those people? Well, I think what it is is that we've got an issue that comes up hard up against their conservative worldview and, in fact, requires a fundamental reassessment of that conservative worldview. It's a worldview that says man has dominion over the earth, that says that there's only one model for progress, for growth, for consumption, only one model that works, a model that says environmentalism is the new communism, that environmentalism threatens human freedom, uh, freedoms in the same way as communism did. It's interesting, yesterday Tony Abbott alluded to climate change, the carbon tax and socialism in the same sentence. And it reminded me of my first encounter with the new speaker of the House, Bronwyn Bishop. We were at a function. Uh, there were a few senators and members at this function. And uh, uh, Bronwyn Bishop, the new Speaker of the House, came along to introduce herself. 
Um, I'd never met Bronwyn before. It was my one and only encounter with the new speaker. I introduced myself as the Green Senator for Victoria, and Ms Bishop's response was, Oh, the Greens! You're worse than the Communists! What an interesting little window into the world of the Conservatives that was. What an interesting little window we had into the worldview of the economists. Of course, most of this is absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. The irony of having the party of the market propose a policy to hand out cash to the polluters while denying a market mechanism. Now, my economics teaching made it Order. very, very clear Order. that if you want to maximise freedom, you put a price on externalities, you internalise them, and you make individuals give them the opportunity to make choices. But not this government. We'll write out the big checks to the polluters. Um, you could ask about the freedoms that the people of Kiribati are currently uh, experiencing when their homes sink under rising sea levels. Tell me about their freedoms. All the freedoms of the people in the Philippines now who have lost their homes and their families. What about their freedoms? Of course, we'll be told that linking extreme weather events to climate change is opportunism. Um, you know, it's easy sport picking on the Greens. I haven't heard anybody pick on the representatives of the Philippines currently at the climate change talks in Warsaw who made exactly the same point. Where were the editorials from News Limited? Where was a Simon Birmingham's criticism of the Philippines delegation? Of course there wasn't one, because they're gutless. Order. Just uh, like order. Just Senator Di Natale, you must refer to uh, members of this chamber by their title. Just like the woman uh, with the uh, breast cancer who refused to get treatment until too late, it's far too difficult for the coalition to reassess their view of the world in the face of what is a looming catastrophe. Of course, it's not just about uh, climate change denialism. That would be far too simplistic. It's this heady cocktail of denialism and political opportunism. It's how we end up with conviction politician John Howard, who says, well, you know what? That ETS I put to the election in 2007, well, I didn't really believe in it. Um, actually, it was more about the drought and people were a bit worried about that. And then there was that movie from Al Gore. That was a bit of a problem. And we had Kevin Rudd and everyone jumped on that bandwagon. I had no choice. Political opportunism writ large. Of course, let's remember that the new Prime Minister his only Prime Minister because he saw a political opportunity within his own party to make a case for winding back action on climate change, because of course uh, Prime Minister Abbott is the weather vane on climate change. Uh, and he managed to scrape over the line by a vote. The climate change denies in his party won out, and the political opportunism of the Prime Minister gave him the leadership of the Liberal Party. Of course, um, uh, that would be letting the, government off, the, the former government off the hook too easily. Uh, it was the refusal to take the ETS to an election, followed by the election of a new Prime Minister who initially ruled out a carbon tax, proposed a citizens' assembly, then reintroduced a carbon tax and at the last election then withdrew the carbon tax. So, we have, Order. Order. so we have the situation of political Order. opportunism meeting political cowards, and that's how we've ended up in this position. Um, and the, the experience of the uh, uh, tobacco uh, lobby and the uh, association between smoking and lung cancer is instructive uh, in this instance. Uh, you know, it took 50 years before we were able to establish definitively and get action, government action, on smoking and lung cancer. How did it happen? It happened because we, what we saw was uh, a, a hugely powerful vested interest, a few crackpot scientists 
and some politicians who thought this was all part of some conspiracy by the public health lobby. Those pesky doctors, they want to curtail our freedoms. They want to curtail our freedoms. That's, that's why we can't let anyone believe that smoking causes lung cancer. It's all part of a global conspiracy to curtail freedom. How ridiculous. How utterly ridiculous. Looking to the eyes of somebody who's dying from lung cancer, who was told for years that their smoking had nothing to do with it, and talk to their children about their freedom to have a life without a parent. And that's what we're faced with in climate change. We've got John Howard, whose gut instinct is that this is overblown. This is all part of some crazy conspiracy. My gut tells me that, you know what, we're going a bit too far with this climate change nonsense. Gee, I'd love to practice uh, my medicine like that. Yeah, you know, you've, that lump under your arm, it looks a bit nasty, but my gut tells me there's nothing wrong with it. Go home, take a Bex, have a lie down. The world of science doesn't operate like that. The physical world doesn't operate like that. Your narrow view of the conservative dogma to which you subscribe and have subscribed to all your life might. The physical world doesn't work like that. So we've got a situation now where we've got um, this farce of a policy, direct action, a policy that is not backed up by an economist worth their salt. We've got record storms occurring right around the world, and we've got record stupidity in this parliament, with the government now proposing to undo some of the most ambitious, some of the most important climate change legislation anywhere in the world. And how is it that only in Australia, talking about climate change and extreme weather is a political statement? It's not in the Philippines. We have got the delegation to the UN talks in Warsaw urging us to take action. In his words, if you deny climate change, get out of your ivory tower, come to the Philippines and see what havoc and destruction it's wrought on our people. Their words, not mine. But of course we won't see Andrew Bolt's editorial on that today. Much easier sport attacking the Greens. Much easier. And it's gutless. Gutless. You see, we've got a vision from this side of politics that says small government is the aspiration. Small government. That's not a vision. That's no vision at all. We want better government. We want a government that says we're dealing with the reality of climate change. Let's pull together and let's do something about it. Let's do something about it. You see, we're all in this together, mate. We're all in this together. Uh, uh, I see uh, my colleague Senator Ryan nodding his head. Um, the atmosphere, the oceans, they're everybody's problem. They're everybody's problem. And if we don't take collective action, uh, the science, not the Greens, not an individual like Tim Flannery, but the vast body of science right around the world, you know that thing, science, that tool we have for gaining knowledge and wisdom? Probably the best one we've got for it is telling us we've got to act. We have to act. And you know, the great tragedy here, the great tragedy is it's not going to take much. It's not going to take much. A small proportion of our GDP, much smaller impact than what occurred during the uh, imposition of the GST. How is it that our politics has become so ossified that even this tiny little adjustment? means that we can't take action. And it's because the deniers are in charge. The climate deniers are in charge, and they're in charge in this unholy alliance with the big end of town. Well, the community are confused at the moment. I understand that. We're at a very low ebb. We've seen the um, abolition of the Climate Commission. We've got the Clean Energy Finance Corporation told to stop investing, the authority uh, uh, being ignored, the Climate Change Authority, a whole body of expertise in government not able to act. We've got the spectre of Greg Hunt, I'm so committed to climate change, I'm going to do my thesis on a price on carbon, um, then crawling back into his cave and saying, well, you know what, I don't think we'll send a minister off to the uh, climate change talks in 
uh, in Poland. Regardless of whether this parliament acts, the Earth's going to do its own campaigning. More droughts, more floods, more tropical storms, um, more deaths, more disease. You can't just you know, sit there in your ivory tower, in the words of the uh, UN delegate uh, uh, from the Philippines to the climate change talks. You can't just sit there in your ivory, in your ivory tower um, and do nothing about it, because what will happen is, is that the earth will make its own uh, statement very, very clear. Um, we need to act. We need to act quickly. And we need a government that is going to show uh, some courage, uh, some leadership, um, some direction on this issue. Uh, not a government that is going to, uh, with its buddies in the big end of town, not a government that is going to um, live in this state of denial that it's in, that's not going to be prepared to say, well, you know what, this is something uh, we need to confront. Maybe we've got some things wrong. Maybe we need to redefine some of our notions of progress. Maybe we need to uncouple the idea of growth with um, fossil fuel uh, uh, um, development and exploitation. And you know what? Maybe if we did that, we um, uh, create new jobs, uh, have new industries. Uh, maybe what we do is we'd have a situation where uh, people in parts of Victoria, uh, like Portland, uh, uh, like um, Warbra, uh, uh, can get jobs in high-tech value-added industries, uh, engineers, uh, manufacturers and so on. Maybe there are opportunities here that we can exploit. But no, it was the uh, politics of fear that won this election. Uh, but soon the Australian community uh, will truly fear uh, what the future may bring in a uh, environment where climate change is with us, uh, that extreme weather uh, gets worse, uh, where their children and their children's children won't enjoy the same quality of life that we enjoy. And, uh, and when we get to that moment, uh, when we get to that moment where um, the Australian community uh, uh, are in an, are, uh, begin to acknowledge that what they've been sold for the past three years, a camp three years is a campaign of fear and ignorance, uh, then we will begin making the steps we need uh, to truly address action uh, on climate change. Thank you.